Our guest this morning, Michael Merck, is Director of Corporate Communications for Steelcase Incorporated, a global leader in the office furniture industry. Steelcase's mission is to help create great experiences wherever work happens. Their brands offer a comprehensive portfolio of workplace furnishings, products, and services inspired by 100 years of insight gained serving the world's leading organizations. Appointed to this role in April of 2010, Mr. Merck is responsible for developing strategy for Steelcase's corporate communications across all functional areas, including employee communications, public relations, and investor relations. Most recently, he was director of brand marketing at Turnstone and director of marketing with the Growth Initiatives team, relocating his family from Strasbourg, France, to Grand Rapids, Michigan. In those roles, he was responsible for the evolution of the Turnstone brand, as well as developing a brand strategy for Steel Cases Growth Initiative projects. Prior to that, Mr. Merck helped to create the Steel Case brand experience and strategy in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And he led the first initiatives for sustainability for Steel Case in Europe. He began his career in September of 2000 in Rosenheim, Germany, as Director of Marketing Communications for Steelcase, preparing the ground for the brand strategy in Central Europe. Prior to joining the company, Michael gained brand and communication experience in various roles with international office furniture brands. He was born in Freiburg, Germany in 1966. Mr. Merck served the German Air Force for two years. He resides in Grand Rapids, Michigan with his wife, Brigitte, and his son, Maximilian. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would, please help me welcome to the Notre Dame campus, Michael Merck. Good morning. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you for having me here today. It's an honor to be with you on this lovely Friday morning. So let's talk about the future of work. Well, the first thing that I probably should talk about is as a corporate communications director of Steelcase Inc., I create strategy for communication across all major areas uh, for the company. So I should clarify when we talk about the future of work, um, this is, I personally not carried out the research that I'm talking about. What, I'm, um, what my role is here more is that I help to tell the story, to inspire meaning and create action amongst multiple audiences, like for example, our employees around the world or the general public, for example. So what you're gonna see or hear today is more something that is showing a perspective from an enterprise that is about work, to show how work, how people and organizations are working today and how they might work in the future. So I've been inviting you to this journey. Uh, Jim has given you a little background on what uh, I've done so far with Steelcase, 14 years. As, uh, as you can hear, I'm a native of Germany, uh, pretty quickly probably. Um, two years in Rosenheim, lovely place. Then I've been uh, six years in Strasbourg. So I lived in different cultures. I was at, the, at Steelkiss on three different payrolls, actually, different systems. And you experience a culture a little bit different when you are on the payroll directly. So I have, um, uh, I've enjoyed that so far. And uh, we're since five years in the US. I'm learning, I'm getting to know this country better, the market, how to communicate in this country. And uh, we're loving it. Michigan, Grand Rapids is a lovely place. Also learning certain things that how close Michigan can be to Alaska in winter. Uh, but luckily we're in the two weeks period that's called spring. <laughs> so, but let's go through quickly what we say what Steelcase is. Jim has given a quick introduction that describes us and I wanna restate again because it's important for the journey to talk about, um, to talk about Steelcase and to talk about the future of work. Whenever we get the time, we introduce ourselves, not as the largest manufacturer of office furniture in the world, but a little bit differently, like what he said, which is kind of like for over 100 years, Steelcase 
Inc. has helped create great experience for <coughs> the world's leading organizations wherever work happens. Steelcase and its, its brands, including Steelcase, Coalesce, Design Text, Details, Nurture, Polyvision, and Turnstone, that I work for, um, offer a comprehensive portfolio of furnishings, products, and solutions inspired and designed to unlock human promise to support the creation of social, economic, and environmental sustainability. We are globally accessible through a network of channels, um, including over 800 dealer locations. Steelcase is a global, industry-leading, publicly traded company with a fiscal 2014 revenue of 3 billion US dollars. This is the official boilerplate. We use that whenever we get the chance to do that, but of course there's a different story that I would like to introduce you today. Like, um, we are, because we're in a B2B world, of course, and, um, and we're working on our, on our awareness, and uh, there are some moments you know, where I wish we would be known a little bit better, and maybe you can help uh, us today <laughs> to uh, share what we really are and what we do, because sometimes when I experience, when I show up in front of the immigration desk, when I travel into this country, you show your visa, and the officer asks you, Zilkes, what are you doing? I'm not telling you what I've told him. Of course, I'm telling him, well, we're the largest <laughs> manufacturer of office furniture. And because if I would use the other part, he probably wouldn't let me in the country. So that's one of the challenges that uh, we see as communication professionals from time to time, that we have to change the perception. And, uh, and our journey regarding the future of work is something that we're confident that can help us on this one. But let's talk about something more exciting. Let's talk about your, your future, your future, your career, or you, and your future workspace. You're all in a different phase of your life at the moment. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk later about offices, and some of you may have not been exposed as much as I have been. I'm, I'm 48, I've been a child of the office furniture industry. I grew up with offices in the last 30 years. You haven't seen one probably. So, but I would like to understand later in the discussion of what do, what do you, what, what's your picture at the moment about your future workspace? How do you envision it? Where do you think you have your first big idea? Where do you think you're gonna, you would like to take the people you work with to have some ideas? Can you, can you picture a certain setting? A lot of people don't think about place very often. In the past, people were driven by status elements and thought, I would like to have a corner office if you live in New York, for example, you work in New York. So this is something I would like to understand later in the, in the conversation, maybe you have some questions about that, once you've seen what we are doing and how we look at the future of work, because you will be part of that future. We think a lot about that, the workplace, we gave a great deal of thought to that, and um, in order to do that, I would like to go a little bit back to an important moment in the history of our company that you will maybe experience one day with your company too, which was our 100th anniversary. It happened in 2012. As a part of that celebration, we began a conversation that involved thousands of our employees, hundreds of dealers, thought leaders, and ch children around the world, because we wanted to have a dialogue we wanted them to participate in a dialogue about the future. The mission we've received from our CEO at the time was we want to generate optimism and position the company for the future. And we wanted to ask our employees too to help us. We wanted their input. How can we do that? This was a very, this was a very um, interesting uh, experience because, um, this is, is because it's an important uh, moment in the mild, in an evolution of a company. So some people would call that also, you would brand the company from the inside out. This is literally what we've done. And it shaped, it helped to shape the way how we talk about it and, what, and, and how we look into the future today. 
When we, uh, the thing that I would like to share with you now is an animation that has been created for the anniversary celebration. It was inspired by a, a very famous TED Talk in 2009. Do some of you follow TED Talks? Yeah. Stilkes is a very strong supporter of TED for over 20 years. We're the space convener for TED. We set up the environments like what, what you are doing, what, what you are sitting in here. Simon, Simon Sinek was talking about how great leaders inspire and that they inspire starting with a why. You should start, before you talk about what you do and how you do things, you should talk about why you do that. What's your purpose? And that anniversary event helped us to think about that. And I would like to share that short clip with you because I think it's an important element for that conversation. Our story began with a simple innovation, a fireproof wastebasket. From the start, it was a story about the future. We've been in business now for a century. In that time, the world has changed in ways no one could possibly have imagined, and change itself comes faster every day. In our industry, furniture has changed, office systems have changed, the nature of work itself has changed. Once, a desk was an island. Now, everyone everywhere is connected all the time. We have to ask ourselves, if everything that was once new is now gone, what has sustained our business? And what will sustain it in the future? Looking back, the answer isn't hard to see. The rock in that sea of change was people. Looking back, it's clear our company was always about more than tools and what they could do. It was about human beings and what they could do. People are the fuel of innovation and enterprise. Everything else, however inspired, is just a means to this end. Work can bring out the best in everyone. Through work, everyone can make life a little better. This was true then, it's true now, it will be true tomorrow and true the day after that. We built a business on human insight. It's the quality of our insights that made us and makes us fit for competition. Now we're entering a time of mobile collaboration, when for our end user, work will happen wherever they happen to be. A workplace won't be a place on a map, but a place on a clock. Big working systems will be replaced by smaller and more fluid ones. Work environments won't anchor people, but empower them as they pass through. At our heart is a belief that people, infants, children, women, men, are full of promise. You see it when you look in someone's eye. It's the stuff life is made of. Why do we exist as a company? Why do our customers trust us? Why do we go to work every day? The answer is because we do something very well, something that matters, no matter what century it is. We unlock human promise. And if we stay true to this simple idea, our company will prosper. It will sustain us in the unknowable future when for all we know, chairs will materialize under us, just as it did when we started on this road of innovation with a simple wastebasket. There's never been a time when the world has had more work to do or when insight and innovation were more in demand. Our story, our future, is just beginning. So this three-minute clip has been shown within eight weeks to 10,000 employees around the world. We did that in six different languages, and um, it had a tremendous success because I know this speaker series is about 10 years hence, but it really helped us. This exercise of looking back helped us to understand that we have a history of looking forward, and we gain confidence. And no matter what, what we've done in those 100 years, whether it was creating our first metal waste basket to prevent office fires at the time, because everything was out of wood at the time. Whether it was um, working with celebrated architects like Frank Lloyd Wright, whether it was bringing color to the office at the time in the 50s when anything, anything was navy gray, yeah? or when we laid out the foundation for the workplace today and systems furniture category itself. When we pioneered products in acoustics, 
ergonomics or sustainability or when we started leading our industry when it comes to research about how people work, we've understood something very important that when we look at all this history, the history has always been about people and it helped us to talk about our purpose. Because we unlock human promise by helping create great experience wherever work happens. This endeavor has always pulled us forward. It helped us to, to propel us and it, con and it renewed our clarity you know, that we, we cannot focus on the stuff of work because that changes all the time. You, know? you think about the future. How we make it changes all the time. What we make changes all the time. To focus on the future, we must focus on the stuff of life, on things that people on the people and the work they do to make life better. Work isn't going away. I think you've seen that in that animation, our belief that there is, there's way more work to do now. Yeah? There's never been more work, and it's getting more challenging and complex. So what we also see is that the exponential pace of change is dramatic. I want to share with you something here that uh, is um, uh, a classic example, some of you may know Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel. What he came, Moore's law since 1965 has remained true ever since, that every five years technology grows ten times more powerful. Yeah? When you look at the cell phones that you have in your pockets at the moment, when you think where they've been ten years ago, they've been very basic. When I look at my history of buying televisions the last twenty years, it was kind of mind-blowing what they can do today and what they could do. And the funny thing is, they haven't changed that much when it comes to price in, in, in the relation. So there is an increasing pace of change at the moment. I came across this visual, uh, it was I think two weeks ago, three weeks ago, March 27th, I think with Google, shared the fact how quickly um, mobile searches have increased, 120% over one year. Well, for you as young people, this is normal, this is a reality. But we need to understand that it took radio 38 years to reach 50 million households and Facebook just three and a half. So this is something when we talk about 10 years hence and you look 10 years back, wow, there's, there's, there's a lot that has happened. And it also changed what we do and who is now in power. This is a quote I want to show from Peter Diamandis, the X uh, Prize founder. Um, and you can read that what he said, that a Maasai warrior on a cell phone in Kenya has better mobile communication than President Reagan in the 80s had available. This really shows that great ideas will come from anywhere. Today it may be emerging ge markets, geographies, but tomorrow those markets, thanks to technology and the other forces that we have out there, will become a pool for growth, for talent, and innovation. So this is something we, we need, to have, need to have on the radar. And what happens if we don't do that? If we don't embrace the change? I've met people you know, in my career who said, I, you know what, I'm going to retire in five to ten years. I'm not picking, taking the computer on. Well, you can't do that today. Like you grow up on the internet. You didn't grow up on the internet. Edward Snowden said that uh, four weeks ago, this is, the, this is the society, this is the generation that is in the internet. So this is a whole different situation. If you don't go with a change, that has consequences. And when you look at the, the Fortune 500 list since 2000, we realize there are some names that you probably don't remember, that you probably don't even know, 40, because 40% 40 of them are not on the list anymore. And some of those companies have actually disappeared. When you look at the Fortune 500 list since 1956, from 1956 to 2011, 87% of those companies are not on there. And I can tell you it means a big deal for us as a 100-year company when it comes to that part. So change in the environment has also shown a lot of change in the, in the work environment. I hope this is not too dark. You can see that. because. 
This picture shows how companies have worked probably 10 years ago. But to be very honest, maybe a lot of companies look like that today. And maybe there are some other companies who've changed the way they work uh, 20 years ago. The needs towards the physical space are changing. And there's more than just the price of real estate. Yeah? And I want to introduce you to some of those elements. Because it's critical. A lot of companies in the past have built business plans for 10 years. Yeah? I think we all agree that you can't do business plan for 10 years anymore. Yeah? You try to establish a radar on what's going on. Yeah? But those, this window has become um, nearer. But the inside, when we look at our history and uh, the conversation about the future, is that the future is not something we are going to. We've understood that the future is something that we are creating. Yeah? So it, this, is, this is in our hands. So I told you earlier that Steelcase has been among the first to create primary research with companies and how people work. And um, we actually uh, have learned a lot about people at work in the past. And to, to, I want to share with you a few data points. And uh, to understand those data points, it's critical that we have uh, that a core insight for us is that uh, collaboration is essential for innovation, but also is individual, individual work. So you need kind of both. So let's try to understand that a little better. We have um, 30, a pool of 36,000 uh, survey respondents. And we've asked them and try to understand that notion of collaboration. So when we look at the data, we, we learn that 54% of the workers say they spend most of their time alone. 80% of their time they spend with individual work. Okay, so then there must be 46% doing something together with somebody. This is ac absolutely accurate. 23% spend their overall time together with another person. And there is 24% that spend time with three to six people. So there, there, must, be, um, there must be more detail. There must be uh, more information. So let's look closer to collaboration. When we look at the different nuances of collaboration and how time is spent collaborating, we realize that 29% spend time in structured formal meetings. If you watch the Mad Men TV series, this is the old style of formal meetings, the old boardroom. Eight or 10 people around the room, classic. 46% um, have uh, informal unstructured collaboration. Yeah? But what is interesting is also that there are 25% who have generative activities. They acknowledge that they have generative activities like brainstorming or ideation. Things like that, and that's important. Yeah? So if we would have not looked deep in that, we missed that nuance, because those different activities need completely different tools to do their job well. This is essential for us. And when we ask people in their current, in their primary work environment, in a traditional work environment, what prevents them to do what they need to do, we get surprised. And you sometimes wonder, are they really working? Yeah? When you see how much time they spend to find people to meet with, where do you find a room where you can be creative? And you get this great idea, you will need to find a whiteboard, you want to project it, you don't find this room at the moment. Yeah? You can't get access to technology. Yeah? So these are things that uh, we need to take into con consideration when it comes to the workplace. And you wonder really sometimes, you know, where is everyone? And there's a reason, because there's another strong force out there, and it's called mobility. And this, this number is, has been actually forecasted a long time ago, for 2013. And 34.9% of the workforce around the world is mobile, which literally means they don't need an office to do what they need to do. Or they can do their job at least somewhere else. They don't need an assigned desk. They don't need their own office. This is traumatic for an office furniture manufacturer. That's why we're interested in that data. And you can see that uh, the number for the United States is the most up, 75.5%. Well, there's also cultural implication I need to talk about, because interestingly, um, 
working in the US for five years now, it seems to be that this is the only culture that's really loving that you can work everywhere at any time. I've worked in cultures where that was not cool and to work all the time. And you may have seen the conversation this morning, yesterday on Fast Company, the article that there was a debate in France, is it illegal to answer an email after 6 p.m.? We have big automotive uh, uh, manufacturers in Germany at the moment that think about uh, switching down the email server at the weekend because it probably have went too far. But I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Another data point is generation. So we looked at, you know, how many gener we have multiple, guess what, we have multiple generations at the workplace. Ten years ago there was big news because millennials, the generation before you, or you were arriving in the workplace. And we still had traditionalists who started working after World War I. But they are not here anymore. Yeah? We have the boomers. Yeah? We have Generation X, like me. I just make the cut. That starts in 1965. And we've looked at what are the key differences. And guess what? When, when we ask them today versus 10 years ago, today, the major difference is that Generation Y is likely to use headphones to prevent distraction. Ten years ago, there were way more differences. So it almost looks like that my generation, for example, is accepting um, this new environment, how to deal with technology. The only thing my generation doesn't feel cool is sitting around with headphones. But that's okay. I even do it sometimes, because it sends a message to somebody. <laughs> or oh, I just like my noise-canceling headphones. So. Um, so that's, an, that's all interesting data. And, um, and what I would like to show you now is how do we put that into practice for a company that says we unlock human promise by helping create great experiences wherever work happens. So we've learned now that there is individual work and there is group work. Well, there was always this assumption that individual work needs an assigned place. I need to have a desk. And group work is not assigned. But we also introduced the idea now that it's not only the blue and the green one. There's a nuance to it. It's called owned and shared. The, the topic I'm not covering today is the, the cost of real estate, real estate suppression. You know that we've also had in the last 10 years two major um, um, recessions in our, in our industry that have kind of reduced our market based on the cost of real estate, for example, which is a structural decline. But let's stay with this, at this axis at the moment. We have an I space for work that I need to do. We have a we space for work that a group has to do. We have own spaces that you can count on that are yours. And there are shared spaces that are accessible to anybody in the organization. Yeah? Let's put that into practice for a moment. I have a little animation here. Catch up here. And some organizations yeah, um, need some of them more or less, so they dial the importance up a little more. But at the end of the day, you need to offer a, a variety of those places. So this is a floor plan. By accident, this is the floor plan where my team is uh, working on. And you see there is, uh, we've, we've put a number of, uh, of those places out there. We've structured that. The place. This is on the Steelcase campus. And uh, let's put the furniture in here. My team, let's look. The, use the cursor. We are here. Now, this is where the corporate communication team is. We have uh, three people that are considered to be sedentary. So they're all the time here. That's their own place. The rest of my team, including myself, we are mobile, campus nomads. We can work anywhere. But we have so many more opportunities to work. There's a cafe area. There are telepresence rooms when we need to concentrate. Yeah? There are other places. There are, here are boxes you can book to sit down, to focus. So there are different places. So this really means that we have to offer what we call, I'm going to talk about the other ones too, a palette of place. Because what users, people, we talked about people before, what people need is choice and control. Yeah? And this is the first concept I want to introduce. This is the palette of place. We need to offer variety of places, a palette. So that's the first 
conclusion we've drawn from the data. Let's go one step ahead. Whenever we create or design an experience or a product, we always go back to these three elements. And you can actually see them in this room here. Yeah? We call this human-centered design because the human is in the center. But let's talk about the three elements. What we do in simple words is we literally connect people to people, that's the social element. We connect people to space, that's the spatial element. And we connect people to information, that's the technology element. So you can see that in this room here. Uh, this room is, um, you see the way you access to information, the way you can consume the information that I'm presenting you. So this is something you can use anywhere. When you do your wedding planning, you can think about these things when you do a party, when you plan going uh, somewhere else. Whenever there's a space involved, you can think about designing a space experience. Always think about the social element, the spatial element, the informational element. So we, we applied it on any level, products or experience, solutions. So what I want to share with you, this is two and a half minutes, is the idea of a human-centered design and how we applied it when it comes to a product design. Let's roll that. Oops. That's the wrong one. Close. We love our technology. It really is a ubiquitous extension of ourselves. But what we noticed was a pattern of behavior. When people brought this new breed of devices to work, it really mirrored what we were seeing outside of work. People were much more informal, they were much more casual. So we undertook a global study, and what we noticed was these new technologies, this new breed of devices, and the new sociology we were seeing at work had driven nine new postures that we'd never seen before. And what we heard was people were often in pain. Tablets were introduced just a few years ago. But the workplace and the seating experience had been designed for someone sitting at a computer all day long, not the way people are working today. So we basically deconstructed the chair and went back to the essence of the sitting experience. We assembled a global team and we took our inspiration from the human body at work, how it interacts with these technologies, how we move when we shift from using one device to another. The human body doesn't want to remain in one posture all day. It wants to be fluid and be supported dynamically. That's a big challenge. It caused us to fundamentally rethink how we do a chair. We looked at these new postures in the workplace and asked, what if we could design a chair that encourages motion rather than forcing the body to hold a pose, that supports your arms while texting, that cradles your back while you're reclining and scrolling, that draws you closer to your work so that you don't need to hunch over to see the screen, that fosters movement and changing postures as quickly as you change devices. What if we could design a chair as advanced as today's technology, a chair that augments our experience with technology? So we created Gesture, a chair that was designed for the interface between user and technology, inspired by the movement of the human body, created for the way we work today, it's a new science of sitting. When you feel it, you'll get it. So the gesture chair, a little bit of context. The gesture chair has been launched last year. Interestingly, the New York Times a journalist was a technology person that was reporting about it, not somebody about space or furniture. The product is available now. But we started this project 2010. And guess what has happened between 2010 and 2011? Some of you may remember the first successful tablet was launched in 2010 by a company in Cupertino. And a year later, Moore's Law, at the CES in Las Vegas at the Com Consumer Electronic show, Electronic show, 80 new tablets have been launched. So this product has just come out. And I think it's, it's right on the way, but for those who are, that are writing business cases, so that's an interesting insight when you learn about something and how you build on that. So this is one example how we are how we taking the SSI model, the social, spatial, and informational model into practice. Let me introduce you to another framework. And now we put you in the seat of a company, which is something that you're hopefully going to do soon. If you are running a company, 
you have to take care for, for the investments. Because when we design solutions, we normally design them for organizational performance. And in order to perform, there are three elements that you need to consider. This is something that you know. One thing is your strategy, one thing is your brand, one thing is your culture. The one thing that makes these three things cohesive, coherent, and tangible is space. Space can make it visible. When you walk around on this campus, you can feel the brand of Notre Dame. You, you can see that. You see that as it has a strategy being deployed. I cannot talk about the culture, but you can do that better. When I look, at, when I look up everything, that, and I could Google about Notre Dame, I feel there's a strong culture here on campus. So this is something that is really important. But this is something that we, that's a story, we couldn't pitch to the key decisions ma decision makers at the time. Because we normally talk, as a B2B company, to facility managers. Let's talk about audience for the moment. Those people are maintaining a building. They're not in charge of creating culture on a campus. Who does that? You as an executive of a company. Yeah? And here we can see a shift. Because here's an example of somebody that's going to have the job that you probably want to have tomorrow. He's, he's new in his job. You've probably heard from him, Satya Nadella. And he's representing the shift that is happening at the moment at the C-suite. Because these are the people that we would like to talk to. Because these are leading organizations. He's, he's leading one of those leading organizations that we would like to partner with. Because we feel they are as curious as we are how they should work in the future to make sure they have the right strategy, that their brand is on promise, and that their culture is enabling them, or them, that they demonstrate the behaviors that are necessary to bring everything to life. So here you can see a shift, because what he is literally asking is that, about his strategy, he wants to make sure that they are recognizing innovation and fostering growth. Some of you may remember what the, the CEO before him was just answering when he was asked about the strategy. Making money, period. So here you can see a shift among C-suite people at the moment. And um, this is very uh, important for us as an organization, because when you want to talk about the importance of space to drive your strategy, brand, and culture, you need to be able to deliver way more than office furniture. So that's why I would like to show you an, uh, a video for a number of reasons. So first of all, this video shows how we think leading organizations um, should work. It shows the things we've talked about. It shows individual spaces, we spaces. It shows the notion of mobility. Um, it also shows um, our campus and our people around the world, not only our campus. You see locations here from Stilkes all over the world. This is uh, because this is really what we do is really who we are. That's why I want to show that for you with you. Second, here we go. Leading organizations are the ones that care about their purpose. They know exactly why they exist. They bring their purpose to life through their strategy, their brand, and their culture. And they know how to make this visible in the places where they bring their people together to work. They create places that are destinations designed to augment interaction, the human interactions that create value for an organization by propelling innovation, making them more competitive, and building a resilient enterprise that's based on trust and collaboration. The leading organizations are the ones who understand that in an increasingly complex and competitive global environment, place matters more than ever.
but it also needs to do more than ever. The places where an organization's people come together need to be designed to help them be better when they're working alone or working together, when they're working side by side or across continents. people engage deeply in what they do by giving them what they want most. Access to each other, access to the right tools and technologies, and access to places around the world that offer them choice and control over where and how they work. organizations designed for the well-being of their people, their teams, and their enterprise. And they create places that inspire their people to bring their purpose to life for today and tomorrow. So this is a shorter version of the official uh, clip. The other elements, you can see that on stinkers.com, are showing a little bit more from, of our people, but I don't think we need this here. You could see how, we, uh, how we've learned probably from the data we talked about. Yeah? You've seen different generation, you've seen people collaborating, you've seen an, an overview that you can find where is a meeting room available or who, where is everyone, that you can see where everyone is. So um, this, the principles that we apply here to people in the office are working also anywhere else. That's what we mean by wherever work happens. Because what we've learned here, we also apply to healthcare. We call that connected care. When you bring together the needs of patients, caregivers, clinicians. Yeah. The thing that is different here, of course, is the social context. Because here you're not talking about delivering a result, business results that can be good or bad. This is about how do you prepare somebody to take some very hard information. And how is the space set up for that? Yeah. It's also, there's also a different context when we talk about education. Active learning, for example, is what, we've, uh, what, we, are, what we are sharing at the moment since uh, a few years. Classroom literally hasn't been touched the last 100 years. Yeah? It's all been set up for passive learning that you're supposed to overhear what I'm telling you. You're not empowered, you can't interact. Yeah? We're talking about active learning. And the social element in the learning environment is pedagogy. Pedagogy in the 21st century means that teacher and students are empowered to share. So I know Notre Dame is, uh, is also one of, has been one of our, uh, the first universities we've worked with when it comes to the interconnected workplace and the, and the interdependent world. Uh, but we see a lot of uh, our research going at the moment into the educational environment at the moment. It's been pretty successful. So. This all has created, uh, of course, a uh, little cons um, controversy. And the, the element that created the most is maybe uh, something that we haven't talked about yet. We talked about the palette of places, I to we places, own chair, you remember? We talked about the different postures, that we've identified nine postures, and maybe there are even more out there since the study has been done. Uh, what I would like to talk about uh, now is the palette of, palette of presence. Sorry, English language. Um, presence. You're all here at the moment, this is what we consider to be the physical presence. There is the other presence at the moment, that's the virtual presence, which is something that you are very familiar with. It's FaceTime, that you do Skype, or telepresence, for example, in the professional world. Telepresence literally gives you the audio-visual experience as if somebody would be next to you. And if you design that in a proper way, you can really overcome time and space. And this is something that is a big issue for large corporations today. 
that their teams are disloca located around the world. And it's very hard, this social element, to stay very close with a team member, I have team members uh, outside the time zone. And the likelihood that, um, that you will uh, work with team members outside your time zone is very high because today it's already 62% which is one of the reasons why we see video traffic in large companies uh, incre constantly um, going up at the moment. It's 70%, it was growing again last year, 70% video traffic. So we're literally living on video. And for your generation, that's gonna be total normal. Like, um, but it's, it's important to understand, like for example, when I do team meetings, one of my team members is constantly in charge of making sure that the person on the other side is treated like he would be in the room. And we think about the, the, the spatial, informational, and social. This is something you ultimately don't think because a lot of people uh, rely on the technology. Oh, we have the connection up, it's working, he can hear us. Once you're on the other side, you really see that somebody should take care for that. My little one uh, is eight years now. He's mostly seen his uh, grandmother via telepresent, video, sorry, via FaceTime or Skype. Um, and it really, and he has a very strong connection. Why does he have this strong connection? Because from time to time, he meets her in person. We've learned that we cannot attend live via video conference. At least from time to time, you have to build this relationship. But you can maintain it virtually. So we need to make sure we design for this experience and just not make sure that the technology connection is up. This is an important element, living on video, to be cognitive of this element. The controversy, of course, has started, and you may have, and there was an article in, uh, in Fast Company earlier that we've announced a partnership with Susan Cain, that some company have, companies have, of course, pushed the workspace design too far for we spaces and shared spaces, which means that there are some people who really feel they're left behind, and one of them are, for example, introverts. In her book, Quiet, The Power of Introverts, Susan Cain uh, is talking about the need for alternative spaces. Because if those people don't find those spaces in the office, they will leave. They will leave and go home. They will leave to work in a shop or in a, in a coffee shop, for example. And that's not the best place to do what you need to do. So we need to make sure there are there are different needs out there, and not one size fits all. There's been a huge controversy at the moment. The other uh, debate that projected our business into mainstream media was when Marissa Mayer uh, called everyone at Yahoo, back from home to the office. And it was a big debate, well, is this the right thing or the wrong thing? I think this is, uh, when you look at the brand strategy and culture element and uh, what space drives, this is probably what this company needed at this point in time. So it's not about what's wrong or right, it's what you really need. I can only tell you that um, if I would have to do everything that I have to do from home, I couldn't do that. I need a variety of places. And there's a big debate going on at the moment about this part. It flows into, into the last topic I would like to talk about, which is what we are busy with at the moment. This is the a cover of our recent 360 magazine where we publish our insights and the data and what we've learned and the solutions about the world of work and also education and healthcare. And this is talking about well-being. And this is something that especially for your generation is gonna be really important because um, can you imagine that you would come home from, or let's start differently, can you imagine that the car that you took on a ride for 10 hours comes back from the ride and is actually in better shape than before? Bit of a stretch, but what I'm trying to say is can you imagine you coming, you coming home after a long work day and you feel actually way better than when you left? For my generation, that would have been impossible. For your generation, I think you will see that. You will totally see that. Today, when, we see, when you look at the statistics at the moment, we know that the costs of disconnected employees alone in the US per year can cost companies between 450 billion and 500 billion US dollars. When you're not connected, there's no collaboration. When there's no collaboration, there's no innovation. And innovation is the lifeblood of any company. Yeah? That's why we need to make sure that we address 
this element. It is, as you can read, a bottom line issue. Yeah, we have to take care of that. There are three key areas, very quickly. The first one is what you all know. You may be feel at the moment, like I feel that moment when I'm standing too long. Physical well-being, physical comfort. And uh, we, know, we know it also as ergonomics. 37% of us have, it, in average, per day, um, 30 minutes pain or discomfort. When you're in pain, you're stressed, you're not connected, and we know what happens then. So that's, not, so that's definitely uh, not a good thing. The other element is cognitive well-being. We are bombarded with information every day. 11 million bits is the amount of data our senses are receiving every second. Our normal brain can only process 40 bits per second. That creates stress. Yeah? So this is um, bad for collaboration. And again, I'm repetitive on this one. Every three minutes, we switch tasks. We can only spend up to 11 minutes in an office. In an, in an office, normally, you're 11 minutes on a project. And then you get interrupted. And it takes you 25 minutes to go back into that project. Now, this is costing a company money. When you think about your future business plan, this is going to be a cost. This engagement is a cost like absenteeism, if somebody doesn't show up, or presenteeism, if somebody shows up who shouldn't because he's sick, for example. These are things that have an impact on your P&L in the future. The last one is, of course, uh, something that is coming up uh, more and more, which is the emotional well-being, which is the quality and the quantity of your social interaction. This is something um, that is also critical for, um, for, um, for innovation, because as I explained to you, if you don't have great relationships, your collaboration is not working. So there are a number of more dimensions that we've created, and I only want to point one out here which is probably, um, these are six driving elements that you can read on, our, on the latest 360. I've got one here. There's a paper version also, there's an iPad app actually. Where we show how you can create it in space. Because it doesn't matter to show you all the data and what's wrong with it, I need to show you as a company that creates great spaces, great space experiences, we need to show you how we solve that. We have to walk the talk. A company about work and a working company. So one thing for example is mindfulness. Who is aware of the acronym CPA? CPA, Contingent Partial Attention. So who has just checked his email recently here in the last 10 minutes? That's, for example, what it's about. And um, we talked about, um, not that you're disengaging, I'm not accusing you of not listening, but um, you need to be aware that the recent study has shown that uh, in average, we drop 10 points of our IQ when we do that, when we do multitasking. And here's the gender information, sorry about that, but uh, for women it's five, you're losing five points, and we men lose 15 points. So think about that next time when you're talking to somebody, yeah honey, I'm listening to you, I'm listening to you, yeah, 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 yeah. You're 15% worse if you're male. So this is something that is going to be critical for the next generation of people at work and for organization because it is really a bottom line issue. But let's go back to the initial question I asked you. Where would you like to work? Quickly, my life, I'm a nomad, I'm a campus nomad, I don't have an assigned place, I have a little storage place where I could store something, but I have a neighborhood where I get to, to see my team, you've seen the floor plan. When I come to work, in the morning, I think about what do I need to do throughout the day, and I pick the best place to do that. In the past, in my previous jobs, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I had an assigned desk, and I did what I was, was expected from me. But that place couldn't do that. So today, I have maybe no owned desk, but I have 200 places to work on campus. And by the way, our campus competes with places downtown Grand Rapids, or actually with my home. But again, there are certain things I would be totally inefficient if I would do them at home. Even if I would have the best technology. Yeah? 
because I miss my people from time to time. So I have different options. So this is, for example, our work cafe, where we have uh, some social interaction. I can pick and work in our innovation center, for example, where I could connect via telepresence or physically with some of our designers and engineers. Yeah? I could pick a room and close the door to focus on concentrate at the moment and also have a, a private uh, telepresence, for example. I could uh, connect on the patio outside. I could book one of the project rooms where I could work with 10 people on an ide ideation. Yeah? Critical for me because I consider myself being, I, let's say that <laughs> the right language, I'm probably dropping 20 to 30 points with my IQ if I don't have a whiteboard in a room that I could write on. Because I need to express myself yeah, on the wall and write that. So that's why I always look for one of those spots here, like walls where I have a whiteboard I can write on, express my point of view. So there are a number of, so I have so many places where I can work on. But because I've understood how important space is to achieve what I need to do. So I want to ask you, since you are, you are the future also, you, you will experience the future of work different than I do. And uh, we depend on your opinion. Yeah? We work together with many institutions. Um, maybe you'll be one of our 36,000 respondents one day. But I'd like to ask you, do you know, do you envision today where would, you, would be your space? Because this is something that is important for us, because at the end of the day, you should love how you work. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm open for questions. Please. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Hi. Um, first, I just want to make sure you sell products internationally, right? Not just in the US? Sorry? Oh, can you hear me? Yes, um, I can hear you. Where are you? Oh, right here. Spatial, thank you. See, I have just, I've just had the information. I didn't have the social. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to first make sure, do you guys sell like products internationally, right? Not just yes, in the, okay. around the world. Has your, have you done any research on the differences in workplaces and I guess work styles, you know, from country to country? To give you an example, at least my impression, what I heard was that in the US, you have a really individualistic culture, you have like a really uh, need for private space. So that's why you have things like cubicles and you know, you have your own personal belongings, you know, at your cubicle. Mm -hmm. But say in Japan, you know, where it's less individualistic, you know, instead of having cubicles, you might have kind of like half cubicles where you can kind of see each other's spaces. And, you know, it's kind of normal for you to like answer somebody else's phone. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, you know, have you seen maybe Germany versus the U.S., any differences, or maybe yeah. the U.S.'s culture has changed? Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. Um, I, there are multiple answers to that. Let me start with my experience in Europe, because a few years ago, uh, I had the chance to be part of an, publishing a book called The Office Code, where we looked at six different cultures in Europe. And we used uh, uh, Gerd Hofstede's model. Um, where we looked at all those parameters like uh, individualism versus color, then the, um, the power uh, distance index, for example, yeah, that is different between a high context and a high content culture. We looked at all those elements, and I was surprised how different even uh, work culture or the connection from work to space in Europe is from countries that actually share a border, like from, from France to Germany. But there are a number of reasons. One is, def one is definitely the culture. But one is also regulations. In Germany, for example, you have the right from, every, from your workplace to see daylight. At least if you can see a little bit of it, it's considered to be legal. So that, that's the reason why skyscrapers or buildings are narrower in Germany. You do not have that regulation in the US, for example. And in the US, you have a wider footprint. So and in, in order to maximize the use of the building, you put you, the, those cubicles are coming in. So now the culture element plays in there. Germany is more a team culture. Yeah? Somebody once explained me the difference you see the best you know, when you look at the two, different, the two different sport brands. There's one that focuses on individuals, and there's one with the three stripes that focuses more on teams. Yeah? In the US, you have indeed an individualistic culture, 
but it's also more informal. Work ethics are more, way more informal. And uh, we, see, we see key differences in here, but in, at the very core, the needs of the people are similar. The way they get expressed are driven by rules, by, by legal requirements, and if leading organizations have to create a company culture, there will never be a global culture, like there will hopefully never be global food. There will hopefully always be some Asian and some other elements, but there needs to be a common understanding how you do things, a, a global culture. But you need to be cognizant of the needs of the different cultures, of the needs of an American worker to decide when he do, when he does, when he, when he, that he can do when he wants to do that, whether it's at home or wherever. In Germany, we used to do things between, between nine and five. They can happen in the evening, but doing those things at the weekend is not cool. Yeah? So you gotta be cool about that, for example. Or for example, a few years ago, you, it was not cool in France to uh, get satisfaction through your job. Yeah? You need your job to finance life. Yeah? You don't need life. You're, you're not living to work. So we've seen those differences. And one of the key advantages of Steelcase is being a global company. We have experts around the world which really live in the culture. I would not be able to talk to, I mean, to, I'm here now since five years. I would not be able without those five years. I've been traveling for 10 years to come here for projects with my, with my colleagues. But living in this environment gives me so much better understanding why things are what they are. And they're completely different codes in the culture. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, um, as, just as a follow-up, so I was interested in the fact that you had like, what is it, like cafes, you know, in the workspaces you guys showed. Would you say that in America, work and life is kind of merged a little bit more compared to the past? It seems like you guys are almost trying to create like a second home, you know, with your workplaces. Yeah. So I don't know if that's a trend or not. It definitely blurs more. It blurs more, the boundaries blur way more between work and life in the US than in other cultures. Absolutely, we can see that. Thank you. Michael, uh, thank you. I, I've got a over here question for you related to a reference you made earlier. You referred to personality type and in particular the reference was to introverts. Um, I think most of our students are familiar with those psychometric devices such as the Myers-Briggs and others, which help identify personality preferences. Introverts really would like to have a space of their own. They'd like to have a place where they can go and close the door. And there are a couple of issues. One is sight and the other is sound. They want to block out a lot of what other people are saying. And they want to be able to work in private. How do you accommodate that other than telling introverts to get over it? Well, it's not working. In, in, our, in our context, our CEO is an introvert. So, so we can't say get over it. Um, but let's, let's not do the authority part here. Um, you, can, you can solve that because based on what we just said before, you can offer by offering a palette of place, anybody actually needs, it's not only the introverts that need certain privacy. So certain level you should provide anyway for, uh, for business purposes. Certain financial conversations should be private anyway. Yeah? Certain, certain other conversations like we talked about in healthcare, they should be private. So it's not that there's no need for privacy. You just have to dial that a little bit more up and be, be more cognizant to make sure you're not losing the potential of that part of the workforce. So it's absolutely possible to design against that. Yeah. There was a question. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation with us. Um, just sort of a general question regarding uh, something you spoke about um, in this sort of paradigm shift that's happening in education um, as we move from sort of passive learning in the classroom to more active learning and kind of how that relates to the palace, uh, palette of presence 
that you were talking about, so telepresence and video conferencing and stuff like that. A number of our, uh, my classmates and I had a class yesterday um, in one of the classrooms in the basement, and we had a to give presentations to our professor via a video call. Um, and I just kind of was observing um, throughout the, the class period sort of how, um, how little engagement there was really. Um, we're usually a pretty uh, curious and engaged bunch, I think, as a class. But yeah, so just if you could maybe speak about that, you said that there was, uh, I guess, some research that Steelcase does um, involving sort of how that works in, in education. If you could just kind of speak to that a little bit. Well, in education, you need to, the one thing we, we've understood pretty quickly is that it's not only about the technology, but the technology is a driving element. The students are very often uh, more able to master the technology than the teachers. That's one thing. Um, and the other element is that um, in order to empower the audience, you need to give everybody a chance to speak up. And um, the way the rooms were designed, like this room here is designed, is I, uh, that doesn't give everybody the same power to speak up. You know, I should be in the middle. You should be around me, for example. And I should be able to step out. And that's the physical conversation. And to your question on the virtual, how do you bring those people also in there? Normally, in, there is one display where the person gets projected in. And you totally focus on the physical presence and the, per oh, oh, and we have this person here. Let's not forget that. So it gets by, de by design not included. The moment you design, you, in you include the virtual participants in the design of the space that they have almost the same size, for example, mm. on a screen, that you almost feel like it's, a, it's, a, it's somebody sitting at the table. If you like to, de if there would be a, a round table and everybody would be sitting, there and then the screen would be just sitting at the table, for example. That's a way how to can bring, that's how this person will be treated better. And if you treat them and engage them more, they don't pass out. I've done telepresence for longer than six hours, yeah, and started at three o'clock in the morning. So this is a hard one. And if you feel that you cannot contribute, you get disengaged. Yeah, that's a key problem. I don't know, some of you, have you seen the TED talk with uh, Ed Snowden a few weeks ago? It was actually live broadcast, live stream. When he was, of course, he couldn't be in the room, although some people in that room <laughs> wished. Um, so he was, he, was, he was coming in. He, he was on a little screen, but he was treated like he would be in the room. He was on a little robot that was driving in, so was driving to Chris Anderson. Chris Anderson was standing like I'm standing here on stage and was interviewing him. And, and uh, what Chris was also doing, he was taking him with him and the different spaces on, of the stage. Because there was, the audience was all around this. He was treating him like he would be physically there. This is one of the guidelines also for education that you can give to just to overcome uh, time and space, that you make sure you design for that. And you treat people like if they would be there. Because otherwise, they will, they will always be disengaged. And from a learning perspective, it's not like, you know, I know, like, Woody Allen said, life's just about showing up. And uh, you can do that via FaceTime. Uh, but uh, in order to learn and engage, this is, this is critical. The other element is, of course, you know, how can you access and present information? Yeah? And one thing on professional telepresence that is critical is not just the picture of the person. Because normally, when you see the picture of the person and you want to show the PowerPoint, the picture goes away. Mm -hmm. And when the, picture, the face of the person goes away, the person disappears in the mind of the other participants. So ideally, you always have two screens, one with the face and one with the information, which is totally critical. Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for the question. Other questions? So what was the coolest space that helped you to get something done that you couldn't imagine? Before, what was what? Where was the moment? Where had you had your great idea for some homework? What what space would you go back to because you had that great idea? What space renovation did you have? There's something mm, that Starbucks place was pretty cool. Oh, that park bench. Yeah. Huh? 
Which one? For example, Jim. Now I have my best ideas mowing the lawn. <laughs> I just don't have something to write very often with me, so that's why I yeah, can take picture picture of my ideas sometimes. That's a challenge. Now, we've, in my work for Turnstone, we've worked a lot with small companies. Small companies are way more closer to um, where you are probably today, because they think more about their everyday life, and uh, they get inspired by everyday life. And uh, and that was that was mind blowing for me because when you live too long in a corporate world, you're living, you're thinking too much only about the offices that are available versus the things that are out there. They're great places. I had great space renovations. Uh, and uh, some organizations in the past have taken active advantage of space design. For the good or the bad, however you want to look at it, for example, um, uh, faith, for example, yeah? churches, organizations have used space. Space has an important meaning, for example, for that. And uh, in politics, it's, it's used a lot. It has been, uh, of course, abused in the past to manipulate people, but I'm an optimist. I just worry a lot. So that's why I think if you take space into consideration, whatever you're going to do in the future, yeah, maybe it's going to be your wedding that you're planning, maybe it's going to be your bachelor party, whatever, I'm, I can promise you it's going to pay back if you think about your space element, the spatial element, information, and the social element. Hi. Thank you. Um, a lot of the solutions that you talked about focus not only on the furniture and the office space, but on technology. And so I'm wondering, do you partner with companies that manufacture this sort of office technology for telepresence, or do you do it yourself with Steelcase? I'm not sure. And then the related question is, um, I've been in situations where the technology is there, but the know-how is not, and it's just it just never gets used because people don't know how to screen share a PowerPoint and their face at the same time. And, and so I'm wondering what uh, technological limitations you approach mm -hmm. and how you overcome them. Thank you. That's a great question. Because we've understood that with, if we stay a furniture company, we can only do so much. Yeah? And um, so we've understood we have to move more and more into the technology business when it comes to um, how is the software going to look like? Ideally, we can influence. How are the devices going to look like? But we're not going to produce uh, screens tomorrow. But we're trying to, co uh, we're collaborating with the technology industry, of course, to work on certain elements there. There's one example, for example, uh, that's called the Room Wizard. It's a little display, for example, that has been created for us. Our Polyvision division has created it that sits at every meeting room. And it shows green if it's available red if it's not available, and you can book it via Outlook. And you can book it from wherever. If I need a room tomorrow in our Shanghai work life, I can look at the moment when is it available, and, uh, and I can book that. So we've already made some little steps, but we've understood we have to become more like a technology company to really unlock human promise when people work. So that, that's to my point. That is definitely going to change all the time. And it is, and, and what you described is your second part of the question, this challenge of people dealing with technology in the last 10 years, you know, become very apparent with laptop computers. Laptop computers have, have really opened our eyes also, that people were running around and said, I, I need to show you something. Can you see that? You're running into somebody in the corridor here. Can I show that to you? And then you, but I have something. How can you share that? Our Mediascape product. It's literally you know, designed, we've designed a little puck that sits on the table that people just connect the VGA cable and there are two or four or only one screen where you can project and interact. Based on that observation, we, we came, up, came, came up with an insight that people need to be able to share that. So we've seen a lot of people being really frustrated with technology and it's been a, a, a major opportunity for us to do that. Whenever you've worked with Mediascape, and I'm not promoting that here, I've talked to customers and we couldn't go back. You've changed the way we work. Yeah. Thank you. Mike Burke, thank oh. you very much. Uh, oh, thank you very much. On behalf of the, uh, the college, we 
Mike, we have a, a small gift for you with a you. Notre Dame monogram on there. In oh, case the you. meeting space is too cold, uh, okay. our, our thanks to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.